Okay, good afternoon. We'll, I think we'll get started. I have a couple of uh, sort of brief <coughs> announcements to make. One, uh, the electronic exam is up for those who wish to take it. Uh, and those who get above a certain grade, you'll get a certificate. Um, you can access it through our website or through the listserv. I sent it around. And um, I think you have until the 15th of May to take the exam. Uh, someone has registered for it three times and didn't answer anything. And I didn't know whether that meant because the person was terrified at these terrible true and false questions. Uh, you shouldn't be. Or maybe they just made a mistake and accessed the wrong thing. At any rate, that's that. So next week is the uh, last session of this uh, 12th uh, year. Uh, uh, John Hanover will share a uh, discussion uh, with John Gallen, who's the uh, clinical director of the clinical center, and Jonathan Lorsch, who's uh, the uh, director of the uh, General Medical Science Institute. And it, it will be, it's designed primarily for students and fellows, well, anyone, but particularly that group, because the topic is, uh, what does your future look like? Or what, what are the real opportunities? And you know, how good or how bad is the, the uh, current scene and likely to be? And so there will be multiple views that will be presented briefly. And the main thing is a free-flowing discussion uh, from you folks and uh, uh, the three <coughs> uh, speakers. Uh, I regret that uh, I will not be there, but I'll be thinking of you all. <laughs> uh, OK. Is there anything else? Yes. Uh, there is an, a very interesting article in the current uh, science that came today uh, relevant to the discussion two weeks ago on fertility and uh, mitochondrial uh, replacement therapy for mitochondrial inheritable diseases. Uh, it's a wonderful discussion pointing out the, the British have accepted uh, this procedure and are fully behind it. And at the moment, it's under discussion, intensive discussion in the United States. And this is a very, I thought, well-balanced and interesting short article. Now, speaking of articles, uh, <clears throat> today's program actually uh, shows the virtue of reading outside of one's field. So one of my habits is when if I can't sleep at night, I pick up a copy of one of the magazines that's been <laughs> piling up by the side of my desk or so. And this happened to be the New Yorker of July 21st, uh, 2014. Uh, a remarkable uh, medical story. And the, uh, one of the participants in this story is one of our speakers today, Sergio Rosenzweig. Uh, so I immediately went and looked up his work, uh, which we'll, you'll hear about. Uh, and I realized, aha, this is a fantastic topic for demystifying medicine because we have one of the world's experts here in glycoproteins and glycosylation reactions, and that's John Hanover. So that old saying of much is known, but unfortunately in different heads. So maybe if we get these two folks together, we can all uh, learn a great deal about uh, these rare, very rare diseases and what they imply uh, in terms of mechanisms, in terms of how patients uh, react and what opportunities are there for them 
Where is the, huh? you have, oh. So <clears throat> I just put down some of these, uh, uh, my thoughts and uh, suppose somebody has a child who has some extraordinary uh, disease manifested by, you know, strange behavior, activities, all sorts of different things. Uh, and nobody seems to know what's going on. Uh, the local physician, uh, the local consultant, maybe the local medical school expert, uh, they all do their best. Uh, but in the last analysis, uh, they don't know what it is. And where does someone like that go to have a disease like that diagnosed and maybe treated, uh, maybe prevented if it's a genetic disease and the family wants to have more children? And what really happens when physicians say, you know, I've never seen this before? And if the physician happens to be somebody, let's say, at a big genetic center or, you know, where people come and still they say, I don't know what this is. I've never seen it before. Uh, what does a family do? And that's what the story is in The New Yorker. It's an amazing story, which I won't <laughs> take the time to relate, but would urge you to, to, to read it because it touches on, a, on very sensitive issues of... Uh, uh, genetics, how it's practiced, how information is shared or is not shared, uh, how patients take it in their own hands. And as, for example, in the case of here, uh, it was the family that managed to find other families or other patients around the world, collecting nine of total from all over the world. And they then became a support mechanism for themselves and a driving force uh, to get the scientists to take a hard look. Uh, so the emphasis goes from the physician's office. He's not the one in charge anymore. It's, it's the patient that's, that's driving it. And how do families handle these problems socially, medically? psychologically, financially, these are very complex issues, but nevertheless very real. And does NIH have a role in this scenario? Well, those of you who remember presentations that we've had before uh, from the undiagnosed disease group here that Bill Gall has, and we've had many patients actually presented. Now, these are people referred here from all over the world uh, and are screened because no one can make a diagnosis. And very often, by putting together the total resources of this remarkable institution and others, uh, and some exome sequencing, uh, a diagnosis is made, and in some instances, it's really dramatic in terms that there's actually treatment that has evolved. So I like this quote. Uh, which I took from Sergio Rosenzweig's, well, I think this is in the New Yorker uh, article. But the question is, you know, what is the role of a scientist and a clinical investigator when dealing with some of these terrible, horrible clinical problems? So Sergio said, we try to help these patients with rare disease. Sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. But these children are teaching us a lot we didn't know about ourselves, and we can use what they are teaching us to help other people. And today's session is an incredible example of that phenomena. I mean, who would have dreamed that uh, an abnormality in glycosylation, uh, which rendered an individual uh, very uh, ill, at the same time, maybe protects them against viral infection? That seems like a far reach, but that's exactly the reach that we're going to hear about. So, okay, uh, our first speaker is John Hanover, 
I think are well known to you. He's an expert in sickle cell anemia, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> As of last week. <laughs> so, uh, John is a, a branch chief in NIDDK. And I forgot the name of the branch, John. Excuse I, me. I do too. Okay. Um, cell and molecular biology. We, huh? the laboratory of cellular and molecular biology. All right. Uh, yeah. We don't, and, we don't worry too much about names. <laughs> okay. And then uh, after John's speech, Lynn Wolf, uh, who is uh, a uh, registered nurse, uh, um, a, a nurse practitioner with the uh, undiagnosed disease group here is going to briefly describe a patient uh, with the disorder that's going to be discussed. And then her presentation will be followed by that of Sergio Rosenzweig, uh, who received his MD and PhD degree in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and is here uh, as uh, a director, right? Um, he's director of the primary immunodeficiency clinic and the head of the infectious disease susceptibility unit in the laboratory of host defenses at NIAID. Uh, and so he will conclude the presentation and we'll have plenty of time for discussion. Okay, okay. thank you, Will. Can I be heard at that volume? Is, is it okay with everyone? So um, as, as uh, Wynn just said, um, the diseases of, of, uh, that are associated with, glycobio with, the, with what we now call glycoscience are rare, but they're always very informative. And so I'm gonna give you just a really broad overview first of what we know <clears throat> and how we learned it. Uh, and then talk more about the NGLY1 case. So we're going we're gonna to talk about the CDGs generally, uh, N-glycans and their role in quality control and, and why they, in fact, are low-hanging fruit for many human diseases. Uh, I'll be talking about NGLY1 deficiency briefly, and then Lynn will talk about the clinical features, and then we'll finish with Sergio's uh, work on another, uh, on a related pathway, and he'll, 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 you'll see that these two pathways intermesh very nicely in the context of the cell biology. Um, Okay, <clears throat> so um, for those of you who uh, don't know this, and this may be many in this room, we, we're really sitting in what is a hot, has always been a hotbed of the glycosciences. <laughs> this is sort of a brief history of, of NIH glycosciences, starting with Claude Hudson, who's the founder of basic carbohydrate research at the NIH, starting uh, as he was chief uh, of uh, a research branch in 1952, Hewitt Fletcher. Uh, uh, also a, a renowned carbohydrate chemist. Um, four renowned glycobiologists, Gil Ashwell, Liz Neufeld, Vic Ginsburg, and Roscoe Brady. I've had the pleasure of working with all four of these individuals. I really, really consider that a pleasure. I'm currently collaborating with Roscoe uh, and, and of, and of long-term association with Gil Ashwell. Liz Neufeld is now at UCLA. There's also a glycoscience interest group for those interested and the Undiagnosed Disease Program headed by Bill Gall and his colleagues. So there's a lot going on uh, both historically and currently. So uh, Wynn mentioned the article in the New Yorker. Uh, preceding that was this article in CNN. CNN. Um, I don't know how many of you saw uh, uh, the, this uh, uh, movie that, that many people probably ignored um, about Pompe's disease, okay? And uh, in it, one of the scenes that I've played over and over again is um, uh, a scene in which the uh, lead character turns around and said, what's wrong with you? Haven't you kept up on your glycobiology? Okay. And so you rarely see that in Hollywood movies. You rarely see it in the press. But what we have here is a description uh, of, of a rare disease. And this was called Kids Who Don't Cry, New Genetic, genetic uh, Disorder Discovered. And this was the Grace Wilde Foundation uh, beginning. And, and Grace and uh, this Grace Wilde Foundation has played a major role in the patient recruitment efforts. Wynn mentioned this work, uh, which was uh, the one of a kind, the article in The New Yorker. Um, this is Matt Might. I had the pleasure of meeting Matt at a glycobiology meeting. He actually came and hugged me because in my graduate work, I 
had discovered the activity that we're going to be talking about, the so-called NGLY1, um, before at least a percentage of this audience was born in 1979. Okay, I don't know what percentage, but a percentage. Um, and so uh, here is Matt actually meeting President Obama, receiving an award uh, owing to his involvement in this patient recruitment program and what's now known as precision medicine, whatever that is. Okay, so <clears throat> just quickly, glycans are known to play a key role in human disease. You really cannot study clinical medicine without understanding glycobiology. And that's my bully pulpit today. I'm gonna say, you, many people get through medical school without caring, but in fact, even heparin, even the substance that is used to keep blood from coagulating is a glycan, right? And I, uh, you know, this is really for, for purposes of, of selling you that this is an important and emerging field. In fact, uh, in, in, in this uh, journal, it was actually considered biotech's new sweet spot, okay? Owing to the discovery of new drugs that are in fact glycomimetics. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna, we have to go a little quickly today because we have three speakers. So I wanna talk about mammalian glycoconjugates. Now, these don't come in one flavor. They come in multiple flavors. And the reason that people don't like to study glycans, I think, is this kind of figure, okay? They look at this and they say, oh my God, that's so complicated. It's not template driven. It's not like DNA and R. There's no information content. What are those squiggles, right? I don't understand that. What's beta 1, 3? What's beta 1, 4? Actually, what we're talking about are chemical linkages that define a different kind of non-templated information molecule. How about that? This is an information molecule that is not templated in this canonic way that we've been discussing. Is that your review yeah. Article? Sorry? That's your review article? Uh, this one is not. Uh, it's one of the few that isn't. I, I published too many reviews and not enough science papers, I think. But this one was a, a very nice review. I can get you the review if you want. It, it, covers, it covers the field very well. Today, <clears throat> we're going to be focusing on in glycosylation and briefly uh, on the other thing we work on, which is only gluconac, a, a molecule involved in neurodegeneration, okay? So, with that as a very brief introduction, I wanna talk about in glycosylation. Now, you guys have probably all studied this at some point or another. If you didn't, you probably said, oh my God, I missed class. He talked about some crazy thing, I don't know. Okay, what this really is, is, is a fundamentally interesting process where an oligosaccharide built on a lipid-linked oligosaccharide is actually transferred on block during protein translation to a growing polypeptide chain. This has to happen super fast. Proteins are shooting through the translocation channel out of the ribosome, and all at once, you have to add 14 glycans. You know, this is in less than, what's thought, 30 milliseconds, okay? That's really fast. And the resulting protein upon glycosylation has its physical chemical properties totally altered. Now, I don't know why that's not interesting. But when people teach it at medical school, oh my God, they gloss over. Trimming and processing then occurs in the Golgi. There's further processing to leading to what we call terminal glycosylation, uh, having a rather complex structure, which is not as relevant today, uh, but is a very interesting subject. Okay, <clears throat> how did we learn all of this? Well, it turns out we learned it from biochemistry, uh, purifying these enzymes. I, I was involved in some of that. Inhibitors. There are inhibitors at almost every step. I think Sergio's gonna talk about some of these inhibitors later and uh, how we've used them to, to analyze these, these materials. Uh, yeast and somatic cell genetics, and actually most importantly, perhaps, from congenital disorders of glycosylation, which we'll be talking about. That is human diseases deriving from mutations or both exon exonic and sometimes not exonic mutations in these enzymes. <clears throat> so. These CDGs are very, well, there's many of them. I think the number is around 100 now. Uh, if, any of my, uh, if any of my UDP colleagues are here, they'll correct me. Close to 100 uh, disorders. <clears throat> we know a lot about some of these. Uh, I just said there were 100 disorders. Is that close to correct for CDG? Something like that, yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> it's a good round number. Um, and so some of them are listed here. So basically any step in this pathway that you're interested in, you can probably find uh, a, 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 you know, a, an associated human disease. Some are more common than others. Some are very common in, on, the, on the absolute scale of, uh, of these kinds of things. So if you look by compartment, and this is some, a slide that was given to me by Donna Krasnovich and, and Lynn. Um, in fact, the bulk of these 
are associated with the ER. There's some uh, very interesting ones in the Golgi uh, and in the ER transition, uh, others involved in dolichol synthesis and the mannose pathway, but by far uh, the most common of these are associated with endoplasmic reticulum events. Now, <clears throat> the reason for that is uh, <clears throat> the great problem of protein folding. Chris Hanfinson uh, here at the NIH many years ago showed that pep polypeptides could fold, but it's very interesting that people who study protein folding often, I've heard entire talks talking about protein folding in the ER where they never mention carbohydrates. I find that unbelievable, okay? Because, in fact, what's driving a lot of the, the, the uh, machinery involving quality control in the ER are the glycans. Um, we're gonna be talking a lot about this today, but the key enzymes were, were these, a UDP, glucosyl transferase that has a unique property. It recognizes unfolded proteins, okay? It recognizes partially an unfolded protein and glucosylates the high mannose structure on the core oligosaccharide, okay? And then going back one step, uh, this core structure that's reglucosylated <clears throat> is then cleaved off, and if the protein folds properly, then fine. You can process this molecule, exit the ER, go to the gold, you build a fine and proper glycoprotein. But it turns out that in secretory cells like the plasma cell, uh, highly efficient secretory cells, this doesn't always go so well. And those proteins that are malfolded are actually re-glycosylated, re-glucosylated using this enzyme. Upon re-glucosylation, they bind to ER resident lectins that keep them in the ER. And so basically, this is a factory director saying, go back to the factory and get it right. You're not leaving here until you get this right, okay? Now, when all else fails, what happens is the protein, they give up. They say, quite frankly, this protein is hopeless. And so what's done is another set of ligands, the so-called EDIMs, which are another set of lectins, will recognize this structure and through a retro retrotranslocation channel, send it out to the cytoplasm where this Pac-Man molecule, 26, the 26S ribosome, eats it up. So this is a lot like what happened in Britain when the so-called reprobates were sent out to Australia. I hope there are no Australians here. And, and they were said, you guys are unsalvageable, okay? Please leave, okay? And then they want to see them again. Well, that's what happened with proteins. The hope is they go out on the cytosol, get degraded, and never seen again. The problem with the molecule, with the, with the class of things we're talking about today is this just doesn't happen. And for those of you who care what I did in this, <laughs> the activity uh, associated with NGLI1 we discovered in graduate school. Somebody had to discover it. I happened to be a young kid in a, in a glycobiology lab building ours and we did it, okay? But it was fun. So there's this folding cycle involving NGLI cancer. It's a very complicated cycle. Some of your favorite proteins are probably on this slide. It's actually not so important to know the details. What I want to, uh, and uh, although it'd be fun to talk about the details, what I want you to realize is there's a decision to be made. There's <clears throat> a very clear decision to be made. If the protein is folded properly, okay, then it gets exported. If it is not, it goes through what's known as the Kalnexin cycle, fold it properly. If in fact the cell has given up on that particular protein, it's an EDEM ligand and it goes to the cytoplasm for, for protease, proteolytic degradation. Okay? This process is involved. So what process do you think is driving uh, Ah, very good question. How, the question was what percentage of proteins fail quality control? In the plasma cell, okay, that is the antibody producing cells uh, that, are, that are very, very productive, it has been estimated that 10% of those proteins get degraded at steady state, at steady state. In a non-professional secretory cell, um, uh, it's probably on the order of 5%. Through this pathway, there are other pathways of degradation. But, um, that's a very good question. <clears throat> okay, so, so what I've described here then is a co-translational glycosylation mechanism that puts a carbohydrate, we call this the biosynthetic MAN9 structure, okay? It has to be called something, it has nine mannoses. It has three glucose residues attached, and that renders the molecule subject to the, 
so-called Perotti cycle or the Kelnexin calreticulin cycle. <clears throat> if it screws up, EDEM recognizes it, gets exported to the proteasome. If it, if it uh, is malfolded, it can, in fact, go through this cycle for proper folding. And then, in fact, some a substantial percent of these molecules get transported to the Golgi. So let's now talk about NGLI1 deficiency. Why is it so bad? And what does it do? Well, so what NGLI1 does, uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, this subject with Sergio, OK? So, so I'm sorry. Uh, so now returning to NGLI1. Now, the reason that, that Matt and I didn't, and, uh, had had so much trouble finding other patients is this was very underdiagnosed. Okay, it turns out that this may not be quite as rare as people thought, but this is really the first disorder associated with glycan removal. Now you might say that's wrong. Lysosomal storage diseases emerge as a function of lack of removal, right? We've studied lysosomal storage diseases. But this is the first associated with a biosynthetic defect in uh, the removal of N-glycan. <clears throat> Um, through whole genome sequencing, this uh, this is a very interesting story, which I think Lynn will tell better than I. But it, because uh, but but it's a very interesting story in which a whole genome sequencing um, identified this mutation uh, as an inherited disorder, and they actually found uh, they found that they thought it was associated with ERAD based on the, the known biochemistry of this thing. Um, I can tell you that with with these with this very small number of families, um, and this this was actually heroic work, in large part fueled by the patients themselves recruiting families to participate in this. Okay, it was a really remarkable, something akin to 23andMe, very, very strong patient advocacy recruiting these patients. Um, obviously, once the sequence is known, they sequence the exome, and they found the defect rather, rather simply in this case. So what does it do? Okay, this is a, this is a very interesting mechanism for the enzymologists in the audience. The PNGase, or in uh, gly one in glycanase 1, actually cleaves at an inasparagine to remove, actually, this, uh, this amino group. But this is very unusual among these classes of endoglycosidases because you, re you actually retain this amino group because this thing now it becomes an aspartate. Okay, so from a biosynthetic perspective, this is interesting. It's unlike a lot of known endoglycosidases. <clears throat> okay? Um, so. This is what people think has gone wrong, in that misfolded proteins are retrotranslocated. Normally, this N-glycanase removes the, the, uh, the, all of the carbohydrate, all of it, OK? All of it then is subject to lysosomal degradation, where the protein can then go into the proteasome and be degraded. So it's a very efficient mechanism. And it works normally very, very well. The problem is, in, in, in the absence of N-gly1, uh, this doesn't happen. And the proteasome is a very efficient proteolytic engine. It, it fuels catalytic degradation of proteins very well. It does not do so for glycan. Okay, so this is very bad. You can't remove the glycan, you can't get into the proteasome, so you've got a problem. Okay? Now, <clears throat> what's interesting um, is, is, I think, from a, from a patient and, and scientific perspective, is this description of NGLY1 on the NGLY1.org site that Matt Might started. And he's a, he's a bioinformaticist, I learned. Very, very bright man. Um, and, and so what he put on his website is, we are fortunate that NGLY kinase was studied by the glyco glycobiology community long before the discovery of the disorder. And, and NGLY kinase is responsible for cleaving this. He, he describes the molecule. Um, and then, then he describes the clinical features in a, in a very sympathetic way. It leaves the body with an impaired capacity to recycle misfolded glycoproteins, which appear to accumulate in the cells of patients. And so his, he states right up front that the current hypothesis is that this accumulation of misfolded proteins is what causes the harm in these patients. And I tell you, as a basic scientist, um, I love to read this kind of thing, because here is a patient acknowledging that a community of scientists were working long before this, uh, this disorder emerged. And once the sequence appeared, a whole body of evidence was there for them to, to, to actually uh, tap into. And so when we talk about translational medicine, I think we can't forget that basic science fuels translational medicine. Okay? So 
uh, you know, when you're choosing research topics, choose something you're really, really interested in because eventually it will become important. In, the, in my case, it took almost 40 years, uh, but I got a hook. Okay. <clears throat> so what could be happening? We're going to talk about this very briefly um, because the mechanism is not well understood. Uh, but here's a schematic representation from, uh, from a recent paper, what could be happening. So, and a potential therapy. So the basic scientist who followed, so I identified the activity in, believe it or not, hen ovidus. We worked on chickens then. The activity was then followed up by Tsuzashi Suzuki, a young Japanese scientist who had come to the lab to take over my project. He hated the project, by the way. He said, this is crazy. But he took it because Bill told him he had to take it, which is what people did then. Uh, he then purified the enzyme uh, and has been working on it his entire career after that, okay? His entire career has been focused on this protein. Um, so what he is able to show here is that in a normal cell, um, N-glycanase normally cleaves at this, at this site to, to remove the whole oligosaccharide. In, uh, and, and this, of course, leads to proteasomal degradation. What he's been able to show is that in the absence of the N-glycanase, there's another enzyme. It's a less efficient enzyme. It doesn't have the same properties. It's actually known as an endoglycosidase. It cleaves between these two chitobios, in this chitobiosyl residue, cleaving these two residues between them. And it results in this. Now, you don't have to be a glycobiologist to realize that that's not going to be a very good substrate for the proteasome, right? Right? Because it can't, A, it can't enter the RPT, the HTPH channel involved in proteasomal degradation, and B, there's no enzyme that will cleave that in the proteasome. So not only will this thing be bad at being degraded, it will clog up all your proteasomes because they have nothing, no way to dispose of them. The other thing that, that Tadashi noted was that this thing looked a lot like a, a um, a protein that we study a, a lot like the so-called Ogluknak modification. And we've been studying this for almost 30 years. Uh, it is a known susceptibility, um, it's a known modification in, involved in neurotoxic degeneration, uh, leading to tauopathies, Alzheimer's disease, and, and defects in uh, proteostasis. And so <clears throat> Tadashi has also suggested that this molecule may provide uh, they may produce impaired oglucnex signaling. And we're actually working with Tadashi to see if that might be the case. Finally, uh, because of the central role of the ER, uh, this is likely to have many, 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 many secondary effects, okay? Because you, you, the, the ER, uh, while it's working <clears throat> properly, is also pushing a lot of toxic substrates into the cytoplasm. This, this is a very interesting area, my, my colleague Bill uh, Jacoby and, and Wynn studied this many years ago, and, and maybe Wynn can comment. But there's re the, the cytoplasm um, is, is essentially engaged in the process of reactive oxygen species scavenging. Uh, the mitochondria is critical to this process. And in fact, in the NGLY1 patients, there is very strong evidence that the mitochondria may play a role in oxidative damage due to the fact that these, in, these aggregates are being placed in the cytoplasm with no means of degrading them. Okay, so uh, I'm going to now just quickly talk about the clinical features of NGLY1, uh, and these, uh, these are, I'm just going to describe them in broad terms. Uh, in addition to this global developmental delay, uh, these patients uh, have a lack of tears, and this was highlighted in the, in the article um, itself. Uh, they, they make very few tears, yes. Okay, would you like to join us? Okay. So right after this slide, I'm going to be joined by Lynn's colleague, who knows so much more about this. I was hoping I didn't have to go through the patient material, and I'm super happy about that. Uh, so so you're, maybe we'll see an example of the, uh, I haven't seen Lynn's slides. Uh, they have a smaller head, and, and we're, we're going to learn about that. They have impaired liver function, and, and, and perhaps some of the patients, in fact, have aggregates in their liver, uh, diminished reflexes, and seizures. And so uh, I'm now going to turn it over. Uh, very good surprise. Yes. I have a biological yes. Point yeah. So it looks like from your explanation that autophagy is not involved in the tumor formation. Do you think that there is a possibility? Well, so so normally autophagy is not involved. 
However, we know from our work on Ogluknak that it probably is involved when you cleave uh, down to the single monosaccharide. And interestingly, um, <laughs> if you inhibit that endo uh, glycosidase, the, uh, you can actually correct a lot of the, the defect. That's a very controversial finding um, I learned uh, yesterday. <laughs> and so not everyone believes that, but, uh, but autophagy is very, a very likely uh, mechanistic contributor. So. Okay. Changes in the liver. Yes. What, what causes changes in the ear? I mean, in the eyes, you get tear formation. Ah, we may talk about that too. It, we had a we had a, a group meeting about that uh, three days ago, uh, and 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 your guess is as good as ours. I have some ideas, but it's a good question. So let's let's hear this, and then maybe maybe we can answer the questions together about inkly work. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I can do that. Okay. There's only a few slides, okay. I believe, and. I apologize for Lynn. She had a family emergency. My name's Christina Lamb. I'm a clinical fellow, and I see patients in the clinical center, Building 10. Thank you. Um, this one's your late one. Yeah. Okay, and what's next? Uh, just this, this one. one. Great, okay. okay. With um, congenital disorders of glycosylation. And so uh, I will try to present Lynn's slides here. So this first slide is just the... Uh, article where the very first patient with uh, N-glycanase deficiency or N-gly1 deficiency was published. It was published in the Journal of Medical Genetics in 2012 in actually a paper that was more focused on exome, the efficacy of exome sequencing in likely genetic um, conditions. And he was just um, patient number two, at that point a three-year-old European-American male with developmental delay, multifocal epilepsy, involuntary movement, abnormal liver function, and absent tears. So um, as was previously alluded to, the family group was amazing. And that first um, initial case, patient zero, um, the father was actually a, uh, a computer scientist and a computer science professor. And he wrote a blog, and he actually assembled the first, put together the first eight patients through this blog, through other clinicians contacting him and his physician through this blog, was able to gather seven additional cases. And based on those cases, Dr. Enns did a review, a chart review, to discover what the most common uh, symptoms in these patients were. And it was uh, summarized here in this Genetics and Medicine paper, 2014. And so since that time, because our clinical protocol for um, uh, natural history and congenital disorders of glycosylation was just brought up, it was decided that we would be the ones to kind of establish on a prospective um, basis what the actual clinical phenotype and natural history was by bringing them to the NIH Clinical Center. And out of the currently 28 known living patients, uh, we have seen 10 patients with NGLY1 deficiency. At the time of making this slide, we had seen nine. So that's why slightly out of date. And on the, um, this side, the side with the smaller font, is the findings that had been summarized by Dr. Enns in his 2014 Genetics and Medicine paper. And on the right are kind of the findings that we found at NIH. And uh, we based our, uh, our, the studies we did on basically what Dr. Enns had reported, and additionally, based on the other findings that are common in other congenital disorders of glycosylation. We want to make sure that we weren't missing anything, um, such as immune function abnormalities um, that hadn't been investigated previously. And so um, from the patients that we saw at the clinical center, we know the most common finding was the hypolacrima, and we documented that based on the Shermer test which is a test where they put filter paper right where the tears are produced and measure how much tears are made over five minutes and compare that to normal. And globally, the uh, tear production was uh, decreased significantly to the point that it caused um, corneal scarring if not properly treated. We also saw optic nerve atrophy and pallor uh, and pigmentary changes, which are kind of reminiscent of other congenital disorders of glycosylations in humans. Um, we noticed Peripheral hearing was pretty much completely normal, 
but there was an abnormal um, hearing through the uh, brain stem transmission, so processing abnormality, also common in almost every patient. And then the hyperkinetic movement disorder um, was seen in every single patient, even though the um, clinical spectrum is pretty broad um, in terms of severity. Um, abnormal sweat was analyzed because uh, the first, the proband, when he came in, complained of not sweating as much and overheating and exertion. And we noted that this was pretty common, five out of eight subjects. And then um, seizures was seen in about half of the people that we evaluated. Other findings, developmental delay, um, ranged from profound, basically can't do anything from laying flat onto, uh, in bed, not even able to sit up, to um, an IQ of about 70 in the highest functioning patients. And we had the de delayed bone age um, and demyelinating axonal and sensory motor neuro polyneuropathy in a majority of the patients, which is also reminiscent of other congenital disorders by constellation. In terms of the liver findings, we noticed that um, they had a history of very high transaminases, so liver injury, when they were at about a year old. But by the time we saw them, our youngest patient was about um, uh, three. The liver enzymes had normalized, or almost normalized, and the uh, highest enzyme uh, abnormality was only two to three times upper limit of normal, so nothing to be worried about at the moment. And the liver texture was slightly abnormal on ultrasound. There was cerebral atrophy seen on the MRI. So um, just to summarize, basically, the new findings we noted from NIH that had never been reported, I forgot to mention neurotransmitters and the uh, CSF protein were abnormal. And then the hyperimmune response to the rub rubella and rubeola vaccine. And then um, lower than predicted resting energy expenditure. And interestingly, they had kind of an anti, um, they were very happy and always affectionate, um, unlike some of the other um, disorders. And then in terms of negatives, their heart looked normal, their gastric fluid pH, which was abnormal in the FLY model, um, one of the Drosophila models had high gastric pH, it was normal in all of our subjects. And there was no evidence of primary muscle disease which is seen a lot in mitochondrial disease, and no evidence of aspiration on swallow study as well. And this was this is Proban. This is patient zero here at um, his first evaluation, seen under a different protocol. Um, I think age three, and then um, following that age at age six. And you can see that um, he's pretty hypotonic, so he has low muscle tone, which is kind of depicted by the open mouth and of flat facies, but, um, and he's in a wheelchair, he can't walk. And his nipples, uh, it's just a shot of his nipples, and other types of glycosylation defects, a lot of times they're inverted, but in this case they're not, so it's not a complete overlap, but they are slightly wide spaced. And it's just more um, findings in terms of showing his hypotonia um, and uh, generally, um, that he has a, a bit of scoliosis and is not able to stand. Okay. I think we have time for a few quick questions on the NGLI-1 story. Uh, then we can come back at the end of Sergio's talk. And are, were there any other questions that we could answer uh, that emerged from this? Uh, so repeat, please. Is it the NGLI1 mutation? Yes. In yes, these are all NGLI1. These uh, many of these are either transheterozygotes, but they they are they they show insufficiency for so NGLI1. The mutation is in the sugar part or in the protein part? Um, the enzyme is is essentially it is basically uh, either hypomorphic or absent uh, in these. So it's it's the actual enzyme that's deficient. Yeah. A uh, far out question, but any link between the happiness and the lack of tears? Wow. That's, well, you want to feel that one? <laughs> I don't know about uh, being able to answer that. 
I don't know about being able to answer that question. I think the lack of tears, we don't know why. There's several <laughs> hypotheses. So clinically speaking, when we saw these patients, we saw a lot of peripheral neuropathy and auditory neuropathy. And there's a question of autonomic neuropathy, dysautonomia. And so we're still investigating if that is the mechanism. But it's possibly because like um, you guys had talked about earlier, a lot of the secretions are glycosylated, such as the mucins and such. So it could be maybe a secretary issue, and that's really still being worked up. In terms of the happiness, that's actually kind of, there's a couple things uh, involved with that. When we did um, neuropsych testing, uh, socialization on the uh, testing was globally, every single, for every single one of the patients we tested was their highest function and motor being their lowest, um, which is interesting. And um, they, they're sort of anti-autistic. They really engage with you. But I don't know why. Right. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Um, uh, I'd like to ask, I'm sort of curious, what, there was a liver transplantation performed in one of these <laughs> children? What was that all about? So um, one of these patients had a liver transplantation at 18 months of life. And the reason at that point was they thought he may have had hepatocellular carcinoma. So th what happened was he had elevated transaminases. Um, he was being treated for um, seizures, so they checked his liver enzymes. They were significantly high. And then so he had a liver biopsy that showed fibrosis. And then they did an MRI, and the MRI finding found that there was a lesion that was suggestive of hepatocellular carcinoma. And so, um, and he also had a high AFP, but high AFPs have been seen in other patients with NGLI-1 without lesions in their liver. And so they, they did um, uh, chemotherapy and they treated that. And then after that, because of the fibrosis, they transplanted him. But after the explanted liver was looked on, in pathology, the uh, lesion had been completely necrotic, and so they couldn't find any cancer cells in the it's liver. Not, it's not the sort of thing one particularly <laughs> wants to do. Talk about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have a back. So I was wondering, do the patients, how do they communicate? Because it sounds like they don't really have that much speech. So that's a great question. Um, the communication ability of the patients vary widely, but the majority of them use um, uh, devices such as like an iPad or a, or a uh, communication board, and they can answer simple questions like yes and no. They'll point. They really show they show preference, and um, they use kind of um, body language to show, for example, if they want to eat something, they will go towards what they want to eat and show that they want the jello and not the yogurt, for example. It's, it's very clear. Um, our patient that we have in-house this week actually can speak up to five um, word sentences. So, um, and then there's a few that actually are pretty, um, with the IQ of 70, can, can talk. Since you didn't mention, I assume that replacing the liver in that case did not replace the missing enzyme. Uh, again, a good question. So um, it did replace the enzyme in the liver, so the liver thus far has looked great. But so per the mother, um, developmentally, before the liver transplant, he did nothing, just laid on the bed. But of course, that be, could be confounded because liver failure has a lot of toxins involved, and so all he did was sleep. But then after the liver transplant, three days later, mom said he woke up and sat up for the first time. However, when we saw him six months out of transplant, he still had movement disorder. He was still significantly developmentally delayed, although he did progress from the time he transplanted. And um, he wasn't normal. His sweat wasn't normal. So. so uh, do you know how long these patients live? Uh, is it like... So um, our oldest patient that we've seen is 21 years of age, and um, we haven't, none of the cohort we've seen, we've only seen these patients for the last year, have passed away. There have been in the literature reported about four cases that passed away within their first three or four years, 
um, because of epilepsy complications. But um, besides that, they seem to be doing well otherwise, so I'm not sure. Are you going to tell us, is this an autosomal recessively inherited characteristic? So I, I rushed through it, but as you can see from the tree, this is inherited as an autosomal recessive. And, uh, so do you normally then test the parents and give them advice about future children? Okay, Sergio. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wim, for the invitation. Thank you, John. Thank you, Christina. And I'm going to slightly switch gears here, but we'll keep on talking about CDG. So this, we insisted that we bring patients. For different reasons, we didn't bring the patients, but I'm going to kind of reenact the encounter that I have with this family after I get the microphone working. Thank you very much. So this is about glycosylation, hypogamma globulinemia, and resistance to viral infection, and John mentioned before. So these patients, they came to us through the UDP. So the UDP, perhaps those of you that you usually come to these talks, you know, it stands for Andexone Disease Program. So if you watch TV and you have seen house, you know, one psychopath trying to diagnose a patient, there are 100 psychopaths there trying to diagnose a patient. So it's a very weird situation where everybody wants to get something and try to help those patients. So those two siblings, so here we have pointer. Here, uh, Matthew and Elia. So they were, there are two siblings that they came through the UDP program because they have an undiagnosed disease. So actually they share multiple characteristics. So they were dysmorphic facial features, global developmental delay, spastic paraparesis, troncal hypotonia, bilateral hearing loss, optic atrophy, cerebral atrophy, and small corpus callosum, multiple factors, and by the way, hypogamma globulinemia. And that was the only reason I was involved because I know nothing about all the other characteristics. So, but the thing is, those patients came because it was a familial story and there was something that we didn't know what they had. So here's a picture about Elia. You can see she is severely hypotonic, so you can leave her like that in the bed and you can pick her up the next day and she will be in the same position. So she was severely affected, very severely damaged, neurologically damaged, so it was not a happy camper. So when they came here, so we didn't know what they had, but as pediatricians, whenever we see patients, they have all those characteristics that they, which is just, just described, we tend to think that there must be something very essential in their metabolism to think why all those things are happening together. So, or they're the world champion of bad luck that they have multiple diseases or they have just one that affects all those pathways at the same time. And in this case, they have just one disease. And actually as pediatricians, so the people have taken the uh, canonical approach and they thought this has to be a CDG problem, it has to be a congenital disorder of glycosylation, and they did the canonical study. And those are serum carbohydrate deficient transferring, and they did it multiple times. You know, they did it once because it has to be a CDG, they do it twice, three, and they couldn't find anything wrong because this CDG doesn't, is not picked up by this method of that, that, that test. So then they went forward and they did a urine thin layer chromatography and they found this accumulation of sugars. So it's not because they were diabetic, they were peeing a lot of sugar. Not any sugar, not just glucose, it was a tetrasaccharide three glucose and one mannose. And that by itself was diagnostic of a particular type of CDG. Actually, in this case, CDG type 2B, that's a lot of uh, debate about nomenclature, but just keep in mind, they were not diabetic, they have kind of sugars in their pee, but they were not the typical that you have in diabetic patients. So this by itself helped to diagnose the disease that then was later confirmed by Malditov, and here you can see whatever we found in the RP of this patient, this particular type of glycan disorder. So now I know that already John has took you through the whole pathway. I'm gonna take just a minute and a half to refresh your memory about that. And actually later you can buy my book, Like Oscillation for Dummies, 1495 outside. If you don't sleep, it has gonna be 1395 for you. So the idea, as John said, so glycans, they're kind of 14 sugars added together that they are synthesized here in the ER. 
we start outside at the cytoplasm, we start adding sugars, we complete seven, and then we flip it over to the inside part of the ER and we complete 14 sugars. That's the basic structure of the N-glycan. So glycosylation comes into flavors, O-glycans, N-glycans, we're just focused on N-glycans. So here we reach the 14 sugars. Then, as John said, in 13 uh, milliseconds, we transfer those sugars to asparagine in the protein, and then the process starts. Then the show starts. So keep in mind that 50% of our proteins, every protein that you mentioned was said yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, because 50% of our proteins, they're in glycosylated. So almost half of our proteins, they're gonna be in glycosylated. So glycosylation is very important. So we have to be sure that whatever exits the ER, exits the Golgi, it's proper, it's adequate, and it works properly. Why? Because the end glycans help to the folding of the protein, the conformation of the protein, the solubility, how it works, how it's recognized, and how it's degraded. So all those things are associated with the glycosylation process. So that's why we have at least two big mechanisms that help us to control the proper glycosylation. One, as John mentioned, one, is here, is the UPR, the unfolded protein response, and the other one here, the ERAT, the endoplasmic reticulum associated degradation. So here we have the glycosylation process, and here we have the protein control or the quality control of the protein. Here we have the UPR, here we have the ERAT. As John mentioned before, so here we recognize sugar, connexin, and reticulin. We check that everything is okay. If everything is dandy, everything is kosher, everything is fine, protein gonna go through the Golgi and everything is fine. But most of the time, 5%, 10%, up to 80% of the time, things don't go okay. So what we do is we try one time, another time, another time, and at some point we give up. I said, okay, that's it, I've already tried enough number of times, I'm gonna degrade it. So what I do is we translocate the protein to the cytosol, we remove the sugars by NGLI1, and then we degrade the protein through the protosome. So protein synthesis, UPR, ERAT, a minute and a half, 1395 if you want to get the book. So the disease that we found here at the NIH, it was not a new disease. Big disappointment at the NIH. You know, if this is not new, don't waste your time. But we waste our time because we thought it still was useful. So we found that the patient was a compound head in mutation in glucosidase 1 or monosyl oligosaccharide uh, uh, transferase 1 uh, here, MOX. So actually here we can check the protein, the control had the protein, the two patients didn't have the protein, even they had two mutations, one it was a stop codon, two mesense mutation on the paternal side. As I told you, this was not a new disease. There was a single patient that was reported kind of 15 years ago that she was born at 36 weeks gestation, she was dysmorphic, she was hypotonic, she had seizures, hepatomegaly, feeding problems, hypoventilation, and she died at age 74. So that was a very sad story, so we didn't find a new disease, but still there were things to learn about these patients, and that's where we took over them, and we're very interested about their clinical phenotype. So as I told you, so I was called to see the patient and work together with the UDP program, so because the patient were hypogammaglobulinemic, agammaglobulinemic. And you know how obnoxious doctors can be? So I, when I introduced myself to the mom, I said, I'm here because of the infection. And mom said, no. No what, I'm the expert. Patients with a gamma glulinemia, they do have infections. And she said, you know what? I know my kids and they have enough problems and they don't have infections. And she convinced me. I was not that convinced, but you know, I have to accept that what she was saying, it might be true. So actually the patients were severely hypogamma glulinemic. Actually they were almost a gamma glulinemic. They have no IgG whatsoever. Actually the level I'm showing here, the 142, is the highest level I could find of them. Most of the time, they were kind of undetectable. So they were truly hypogamma glubulinemic, but on the other hand, mom almost convinced me that they were having no infections, despite being severely hypogamma glubulinemic. So we did the typical approach with patients that we want to study the immune system. So first, we measure quantity, then we measure the function. So whenever you're thinking about a patient with a potential immune deficiency, you have to know if they have what they have to have, and if whatever they have is working properly. So here, we measure the immunoglobulins, and they were low, but then we also measure albumin. Why we do that? Because whenever you have proteinuria, or you have protein lucian enteropathy, you can pee or poop all your proteins. So in this case, it was clear that they were 
you know, they were not peeing or pooping their protein. So it means that probably it was a production of something in terms of their immune system. So then we measure the function. It's not just the level of immunoglobulins, it's how they work as antibodies. And actually here in red, I'm showing the abnormal results. And to be honest, so we found that they were vaccinated with all the vaccine, all the children vaccines, and actually they did respond to tetanus toxoid, diphtheria, hemophilus influenza, pneumococcal, pneumococcal vaccine, but they didn't respond to Mesenbach's rubella and varicella. And just to be completely honest, I was more surprised by the positive responses rather by the negative. If you have no immunoglobulins, what in the hell gonna think that you are going to have antibodies working there? So actually, this was kind of expected, and this was kind of not expected, but I could survive with that. So then we study all the other aspects of the immune system, and they have white blood cells of every color and shape, so the complement was there and was working fine. Lymphocyte proliferation assay, so this is one of the first steps that lymphocytes do when they have to mount an immune response, they reproduce themselves, and actually that was working fine. Respiratory burst was fine. All the lymphocytes, all the flavors of lymphocytes, T lymphocytes, B lymphocytes, NK lymphocytes, all of them were there. And actually the B cells, because you know B cells is the factory of immunoglobulins, they were there too. So there was nothing grossly abnormal except this thing here, that they were very low, and actually they have some protective titers to some vaccines that were vaccinated, and I couldn't understand why, despite being so hypogamma globulinemic. So we kept on studying. So here is kind of the dogma that I, the way I approach the mom. So whenever we're studying patients that we suspect primary immunodeficiencies, depending the type of defect they have, the type of microorganisms that they're gonna be affected with. And patients that, for example, HIV patients, they have a T-cell defect, they have pneumococcal pneumonia, they have CMV infections, they have toxoplasmosis, they have candida infections, and they have a medium. And this is because they have a T-cell defect. Now, patients that they have a B-cell defect, or they produce no immunoglobulins, so the antibodies do not work, usually they have bacterial and viral infections. But in this case, to my surprise, these guys, they have no infections whatsoever. And that was kind of a big surprise. So again, we took a kind of a canonical approach. We just went step by step, just tried to learn why these patients were so severely hypogamma glubulinemic and why they were having no infection. So we already noticed that these patients, they did have uh, B cells, but we never checked about plasma cells. Keep in mind that B cells are okay, but the big factory for immunoglobulins are plasma cells. They do not circulate, they're in the bone marrow. So we went to the bone marrow of one of these patients and said, okay, perhaps what we're gonna find is MOD cells. MOD cells are constipated plasma cells. So it means they have the immunoglobulins inside, but they cannot poop it out. So they have it there, but they cannot release them. So I said, okay, this is what we're going to find. But we were wrong. We found normal numbers of plasma cells and they were not constipated whatsoever. So, you know, there was not a plasma cell defect. So then we said, okay, let's follow John Hanover approach. So these patients have a glycosylation disorder. What if, because of the glycosylation disorder, they're producing immunoglobulins and they just degrade in them because they are not properly glycosylated? So we check the functionality of the UPR, and here we test that the UPR was working fine. So we use different tricks to do that. We usually measure BIP or GRP78, so it's a stress uh, sensor. So we checked that the UPR was working fine and these patients didn't have any stress in the ER. So there was nothing wrong in the UPR. The UPR was not stressed. So we said, okay, that's fine. But it's unlikely they're gonna be stressed and degrade in a lot of immunoglobulins. But wait, it might be the ERA. The problem might be that because they cannot properly glycosylate or the glycosylation is not adequate, they might be translocating everything to the cytosol and they might be degrading it there. Actually, I was wrong again. The ERAD was also normal. So there was nothing there. So I said, okay, there's something that doesn't make sense. So inside their body, they are severely hypogamma glubinemic. Outside their body, everything looks to be working fine. So then we start to see, okay, what happens if we take the B cells from their body and make them work outside their body? And actually here we found that they produce a lot of immunoglobulins. So we rule out that there was a production problem where we took their B cells and we put them to culture in the petri dish, so they produce ton of immunoglobulins, actually more than the normal control. So there was not a problem of production. Production of immunoglobulins was fine. So then we said, okay, you know, we said that the glycosylation is so important because it's related to the 
conformation, to the folding, to the half-life. So there must be something that perhaps those proteins, they may be less, they have a selective disadvantage, and they must be more easily degraded. So we stress the proteins at different temperatures just to see if there was something that's going to promote their degradation, and nothing happened. The immunoglobulins were fine in terms of different stress at different temperatures. So we didn't find anything there either. So then it said, okay, there must be something wrong. Perhaps in their body they're producing abnormal immunoglobulins, but outside they're producing normal. And no, we confirm that the glycans that were attached to IgG, they were absolutely abnormal. There is a normal glycan attached to IgG, and these were the glycans that these guys were producing, that they are very high in mannose. So yes, we're sure that we're working with the same cells that before, and outside the body, they were working exactly the same that they're working inside the body. So then we said, okay, we cannot put the cells inside their own body, but let's go to another biological system. And we wanted to try what was going on with the immunoglobins of these guys. So what we did is we took rat mice that they're severe combined immune deficient mice, so they do not recognize proteins, they don't mount immune responses, nothing, and we injected them subcutaneously with normal plasma, high plasma, and plasma from the patient. And we wanted to measure if the half-life, that it's something that's related to the glycosylation process, was different. And Eureka, here's what we found. So while the normal immunoglobulin half-life from the normal individual was 21 days, the patient was six days. So they were producing, so they had these cells, they had plasma cells, they were producing immunoglobulins but they didn't last long enough. Why? Because they have a glycosylation disorder, and we will show you later that that precludes those immunoglobins to last long enough. So now we were super happy, but actually we're just half happy because we have an explanation for the A-gamma globulinemia, but we didn't know why they were having those infections. So yes, we explained half of the picture, but we still needed to explain the other half of the picture. And here when the uh, basic books of biology become very handy. You remember when I told you that whenever we check vaccination titers, so these patients, they did have a normal response to proteins or to polysaccharides. But they didn't respond to viruses. And all those vaccines, they're live viral vaccines. So in order to mount a normal immune response to a live viral vaccine, so here you have these viruses. And actually, all those viruses, they have something in common. They're envelope viruses and their surface, they're full of glycoproteins. And actually, our receptors for those viruses are glyco glycoproteins by themselves. So whenever those viruses, they're gonna be recognized by our glycoproteins, so the virus gets into the cell and they hijack our factory. And they say, now you work for me. You don't work for yourself anymore. Now you are my slave and you have to make whatever I tell you to make. And actually, what virus tell us to make is DNA and glycoproteins. And actually, those glycoproteins are the ones that they show the way out for the viruses. So these guys, their machinery doesn't know how to make glycoproteins. So I thought at that point, so our group, we thought perhaps this is a problem. So they got vaccinated. They didn't get any side effects because of vaccination, but the point is perhaps the virus cannot get in because they, like the, uh, the receptor was not adequate, or perhaps because the cells, they don't know how to make glycoproteins, and perhaps they cannot produce normal viruses. So then we said, perhaps here we have something that could be explored. And actually, we didn't go slow, or we didn't go small. We looked for real big viruses to see what was the uh, potential mechanism that explained why these guys they were having no infection whatsoever, especially no viral infection. So here, we took HIV, influenza, adenovirus, poliovirus, and vaccinia. So each of those viruses has its own particular characteristics. So HIV, influenza, and vaccinia, they are envelope viruses. And adenovirus and poliovirus, they are non-envelope viruses. So we said, okay, we're gonna follow the same approach for the five viruses and see what we can find. And the approach was exactly the same for the five viruses. First, we wanted to see if the virus could enter the cell because that's gonna tell us that the receptor for the virus was okay. So then we want to see how much virus is produced from the cells from a patient or from a control. So that was the first was infectivity. Then it was the viral production. We wanted to know how much, how much, how many viruses could be produced by cells from a normal individual and from these patients, because we suspected that the cells from these patients would produce less virus. And the third thing was to collect that virus and try to infect other cells to see if the new virus produced by these patients is gonna be 
as virulent as the wild type virus. Make sense? Primary infection, viral production, secondary infection. And we did exactly the same with all the five viruses. And here we show you just very briefly so what we found. So HIV, we took viruses that were CXCR4 and CCR4 dependent in terms of core receptors, and we found that there was no differences. So the virus was able to infect the cells. So there was nothing def defective in terms of the receptors or the core receptor for HIV. But our big first surprise was here. When we counted the amount of virus that was produced by these patients, they were one to the two to one to the five less log, log less viruses that they were able to produce. So the cells from our patients, they were producing significantly less virus because they didn't know how to make the glycoproteins from the virus by itself. So then what we did is we collected that virus and we said, okay, we're gonna compare what happens if we collect the virus produced by the patient and virus collected by a normal individual trying to infect some other normal cells. And what we found is that the virus that was produced from, uh, from the patient, it was 50 to 80% less virulent than the wild type virus. So the patients could be infected, but they produced 10 to the two to 10 to the five less virus, and the virus that they produced, it was 50 to 80% less infected. And that was huge. So then we said, okay, is this related to the glycosylation? And we concluded that yes. So here you can see, so here are the cells that were transfected with GP140. GP140 is the glycoprotein that covers HIV and it's thought to be critical in terms of the virulence from the virus. And you can see that the molecular weight of the GP140 produced was the patient, it was heavier than the one that was produced for the control. Remember that these guys produce glycan, they have more mannose, so they had high mannose glycan. And actually, when we remove all the sugars, you can see that the protein had the same molecular weight. So the big difference between these and these, it was all sugars. And the sugars, the difference on molecular weight between this one and this one was because of the glycosylation disorder. So everything was sugar or glycan related. So then we say, okay, what gonna happen so in terms of the molecular weight of GP140, if we try to correct the patient cells. So here's what happened. So we transfected the patient cells with more normal MOX. And here you can see, so here's the control. So the molecular weight of GP140 was unchanged, but look the molecular weight of the patient. So it was heavier, but when we are officially transfected with the normal MOX, it became the same molecular weight than the normal individual. So it means that we can make our patients as susceptible to viruses as normal individuals. And we are mean, but not that mean. So that was good, but I thought that it was more interesting to try to go the other way around. What if, if we can try to convert normal individuals more similar to the patients in terms of their susceptibility to HIV or influenza? And here we use what John mentioned, those inhibitors. So there's Fortunately, there's one of those inhibitors that was already available that's called castanospermin that inhibits MOX, the same enzyme that these patients have a genetic disorder. So when we treated, look here, when we treated the control individuals with castanospermin, look what happened to the molecular weight of the, uh, of the GP140. It became as heavy as the one that the patients have. So what we did is we converted normal individuals in CDG, type 2B individuals in terms of how they manage viruses. So that was interesting, and we thought that there has some potential because we think that this really has potential in how we can address viral infections, especially epidemic. So it could be influenza, it could be Ebola. So you can have an interesting tool in order to manipulate glycosylation and how we face different kind of infections. So then the reviewers were very demanding and they wanted us to work with a real virus. We did that, we worked with a real virus. And here it is, when we transfected the cells from the patient with the wild type virus and we were dealing at that point with a real virus, look how more infected the HIV became. Because all the other experiments were done with uh, vectors, here it was the real thing. So yeah, it was risky, but you know, it was worth. So then, okay, we already found that I was able, we were able to produce that with HIV, but said, what happened with another very prevalent virus like influenza? So then we went to another kind of testing tube and we generated monocyte derived macrophages and we tried to infect those cells, so the cells from the patients and the based from controls, 
with influenza virus. H1N1, this, the strain from 2009, the very aggressive one. And to our surprise, the cells from the patient were almost non-infectable. We have a lot of trouble trying even to infect the cells from the patient. These guys, and just let me tell you another part of the story. So mom didn't want to vaccinate them with influenza, and they never got influenza, and they didn't have titers. And actually, we proved why they didn't get influenza, because we couldn't almost infect their cells, because these guys probably have a, def a defect in their receptor that doesn't make them susceptible even to influenza. So these patients were kind of refractory to influenza because you need a glycoprotein receptor in order to bind the influenza virus. So we were super happy here, so we moved to the next virus, adenovirus, and we did exactly the same approach. So primary infection, viral production, secondary infection, I'm showing you here just the secondary infection, and everything was as expected. So we said, you know, because those viruses, adenovirus, is not an envelope virus and doesn't have any glycoprotein, so we didn't find any difference. These patients were equal as controls in terms of their susceptibility to non-envelope, non-glycosylated virus. So then we did the same thing with poliovirus, another non-envelope, non-glycosylated virus. I said, okay, everything is fine and dandy. Let's get one more shot. Let's go for the last envelope virus. I said, oops, we screw everything here. Because this virus, vaccinia virus, is an envelope virus. And we were not finding any difference between the patient and the control. But again, books is where they become very handy here. So vaccinia is the only envelope virus that doesn't have any glycoprotein. So it's not about the envelope, it's about the glycoprotein. So that confirmed us that actually it wasn't the envelope, is where the glycoproteins, the way they were driving the, their uh, resistance or their lack of susceptibility to different viral infections. So here, just to conclude, so we have kind of, we came up with two models. So one model was for why they were hypogammaglobulinemic. So whenever you are controlling the half-life of your immunoglobulins, they are kind of two different type of receptors that they manage and govern the half-life of the immunoglobulins. One that tends to protect them, the FCRN, that kind of endocytose and protects the IgG and then makes it go out, and the ones that they are more prone for degradation, FC gamma receptors. The thing is that these FC gamma receptors, the binding of the IgG is manos dependent. More manos you have, more binding to those receptors. And remember that these patients had high manos. So this is gonna be a normal half-life. But keep in mind that these guys, instead of having this type of glycan, they have this type of glycan with a lot of manos. So our hypothesis was, and we confirmed that by surface plasma resonance, so they were binding to the FC gamma receptors more than the other ones, and they were degrading, so that's why they were sh showing shortened half-life of the immunoglobulins. As for the viral uh, susceptibility, so we came up with a model too. So here to the left, you have infection of white up cells. So here you have glycosylation-dependent viruses, and here you have glycosylation-independent viruses. So here you have, so it took me a lot of work to make those receptors different color than this one, so pay attention to that and appreciate that. So glycosylation-dependent viruses, they're recognized, they infect the cells, they produce a lot of viruses, they infect other cells and blah, 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 until the immune system shut down the circuit and just completes and, and close the infection. With glycosylation independent, same thing happens. But here, in our patient cells, the story is completely different. First of all, they have different receptors. So whenever they try to infect, the virus is identical, but the receptors are different. So the cell is hijacked, but they do not produce as many viruses as the wild type individual. And the virus that is produced is different than the wild type because this cell doesn't know how to produce normal glycoproteins. And the new virus, in this case, and I insist on that in this case, was less infected. And this is what happened with the cycle of viruses that they're envelope and glycan dependent. For the glycan independent, no differences. When we wrote the paper, we were very careful to say, we are on the bright side of the street. So these patients were less susceptible to viral infections, but it's just a matter of time until these changes of glycosylation are gonna produce a virus that is more aggressive, or more immunogenic. And there's where the Englite patients came us to rescue from our hypothesis, because now we found that those patients, whenever they are immunized with MMR, they have hyper responses to certain viruses. They don't get more infected, they don't get side effects. 
but instead of getting a response up to here, they get a response up to there. It's out of the charts because the glycans that they are the immunogenic part of the viruses, they are different because they don't know to produce normal glycans. They produce the glycans that they can. And the glycans that they produce in terms of the rubella and rubella, they are more immunogenic than the ones that they are produced by the wild type virus or wild type cells. And this is what we are focused now on study. So that's kind of close the circle about, we were very enthusiastic about the MOX patients because they were less susceptible to virus, but we knew that at some point, we're gonna find a virus that's gonna make going to go in the other direction. So I'm going to take the credit, but these are the people that really work. So you have here the people at the IC, uh, IDSU, the, uh, the people at the UDP, Lynn Wolf, David, uh, David Adams, Hugo Vega, and Neil Burkle, that's not here anymore, Miao He that did all the glycosylation study, people at Frederick, Kathy Kalba did a bone marrow biopsy, so people at the Tony Fauci's group that they did all the virus studies, so all the HIV, sorry, and the uh, and the vaccine studies, influenza studies, poliovirus study, uh, people at the NADCR that they did the adenovirus study. Oh yeah, I have to collaborate with a lot of people that they have expertise in every particular virus. And then we have the people that they did the surface plasma resonance, the mouse studies, my wife that did the statistics, so immunology service that did the flow, the LHD, and the PAB clinic that was instrumental in terms of bringing those patients and allowing us to see those patients through the UDP program. So just to conclude, 1982, Bill Clinton, is the economy stupid? Okay, that's fine. So just to set the mood of how kind of statement. 1995, David Ho, that was a, is a huge HIV study, said, is the virus stupid? At that time, people didn't know what was the problem with HIV. And he was the first one to recognize, you know, is the virus the one that's producing the problem. In 2010, they said, no, the problem is not the virus, and it's not the economy. The problem is the immune system, that it's not recognizing everything. And actually, I think that all of them were partially right and partially wrong. The point is, we are hijacked with the viruses. So the point is here, so it is the economy, we don't get grants, we cannot do research. It's the virus, it's the glycoproteins. But the thing is, most of the research with HIV at this point is focused on trying to destroy the shield of glycoproteins that those viruses have. So all the vaccines, all the approaches try to destroy the shield. And what these children are teaching us is we can go to trying to destroy the shield or just to prevent the shield to be built. And you know, if we manipulate the glycosylation pattern, what we're gonna end up is producing another shield. So we can manipulate and we can tell our own cells to say, you know what, stop making the shield for the virus because this is harming our cells. So this is what we embarked now, and we're working with different companies. Actually, a company was awarded $40 million to develop those uh, uh, glycosidase 1 inhibitors because they think that they can work with different viral infections. So with that, I close, and I can take questions if you want. Thank you very much. So percentage, if in the world there are 7 billion inhabitants and we have four patients, so make the math. Ah. <laughs> so, so this patient could only be deficient if we were able to prevent infection. Exactly. So they have a selective advantage in terms of viral infection. But keep in mind that they have a lot of neurological deficits that they do not help them very much. So they are blind, deaf, neurologically, uh, uh, with a very uh, severe neurological deficiency. They have swallowing problems. So they have a lot of other problems. They're refractory, you're semi-refractory to viral infections, but they pay a big price for that. So you think we could make some of the immunoglobulin uh, by reducing the number of immune inhibitors to protect from infection? So people is working in terms of modifying the half-life of immunoglobulins and products. So whenever you Fucosylate or defucosylate different biologicals, you can modify the half life. So imagine, there are patients that they need IVIG and they need it every month. If you can modify the glycan pattern, perhaps they will need it every two months or perhaps every three months. So there are different things that you can, you can do. I can see, I can read his mind. 
So I guess that he's thinking, okay, if you are going to do the glycan inhibitors, are you going to become people become blind, deaf, and mentally retarded? So one thing is to have this genetic problem during embryogenesis. One thing is we're already grown ups and we inhibit the pathway for a week or two weeks. It's completely different. I was reading your mind or not? Right, right. Yes. So, but what would you describe it? I can tell you. So because it has been tried. So actually it was tried with carcinospermia in HIV. And actually they tried, it was before there was heart. So before the good treatment for HIV was available, so they were trying those uh, 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 glucosis ones inhibitors. The main side effect, flatulence. So as long as you are not with the same patient in the same room, I think that is kind of okay. You can survive, they can survive with that. Nothing else beside that. So it's a doable, it's an acceptable kind of side effect. Smelly, but acceptable. So I have kind of a moral dilemma with these patients to replace them because their brain is already damaged. So I don't know what I was going to replace. So their susceptibility to viral infections, what I want to make them regain. So their damage is already severely affected and damaged. So I didn't know how much gain, because actually we found a way, because of the type of mutation, we use Belcape to rescue some of the protein and we were able to generate some protein on them. But then I have kind of the moral dilemma, so what, what are we offering them? So okay, now they will have some protein that are gonna be working, and what's gonna happen? They're gonna become susceptible to all the viruses that were not susceptible before. And the possibility of them to regain their central nervous system function, it was nil. So, sorry to mixing uh, moral things with the science, but I guess that they are mixed. So what is the spectrum of viruses which you're thinking of? So in this case, they have to be viruses that have glycoproteins as the susceptibility factor or the virulence factor. So, but we cannot make predictions what's gonna happen with each virus. So we have to test each virus by itself. So each virus with each of the CDGs to see what happened with the combination. You remember that at the beginning we said that 50% of the proteins are glycosylated. So in every pathway that has 10 proteins in a cascade, half of them are gonna be glycosylated. And I don't know if the change of the glycosylation gonna completely abolish the function, it's gonna make it to work more or to work less. So it's impossible, at least for me, to predict what's gonna happen with the combination of each virus with each CDG. So in this case, it has to be tested in an individual case, each virus for each CDG. So we have a great example with this patient with MMR and chickenpox that they didn't have any side effect on one hand and they didn't mount any new response. On the other example, the NGLI patients, they didn't have any side effect, but they were hyperimmune to them because this is what we're testing and we believe that the glycan that is attached to the epitope of the rubella and rubella, it makes it more immunogenic. So what we are thinking again, those are the things that we are learning from these patients. So you have vaccines that they are not great. So what if, if we can use coadjuvants to modify the glycosylation pattern in order to become some, so to produce vaccines that they are not that immunogenic to becoming using more immunogenic. And you wanted me to talk about patients. You have had to see the face of the mom when she realized how much we learn from their patients. So keep in mind that this mom is a mom of two children that they're blind, deaf, mentally retarded, and perhaps they're nonverbal and they have perhaps 50 words total, one of them. The other one is completely nonverbal. When I told her that her kids were teaching us how to face, or they were giving us options in how to fight HIV and influenza, she was really happy. Mm -hmm. And that made me happy. So these patients were born already severely damaged as the other patients. So I guess that perhaps neonatal screening gonna be too late. I guess that this happens during embryogenesis. So I think that even newborn screening gonna be late. I'm guessing, I don't know. But keep in mind the example of the other patient that was born at 36 weeks and it was already severely affected. So at 36 weeks, 
I guess that the game was already over. So that's my impression. So because if you don't have those glycans in your brain during embryogenesis, I think that you will have a very bad outcome. So I guess even newborn screening, that I absolutely agree. And I think that 10 years is too far away. I think it's going to happen faster. So, but I think that still it's going to be too late. So you think the central nervous system, wait a minute. Wait a minute, wait a minute. No. Sorry, sorry, sorry. 50% of the proteins that help glycogen. Yes. What percentage is O glycogen? 50% or less? Is it 50 50 or other distributor? Well, so um, it's about, in, in glycosylation, it's about supposedly 50% or 40%. Uh, o glycogen type is something on the order of 20%. And the biggest class are the glycosaminoglycans. Which, uh, which actually are from the most abundant class of glycans that are involved in essentially every every uh, every aspect of that of vascular biology. So it's it's a it's a probably on the order of ten percent in in glycosylation. Uh, so how do the you, yeah. not, do you uh, agree? Because all the blood groups are all glycans. Yes. So and all the cells express them. So I guess that perhaps all glycosylation it happens in every cell. Perhaps I don't know the amount of proteins. They, they, they yeah. Their yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Anyone else have any questions you want to get involved in this? <clears throat> so it, it seems rather amazing that uh, uh, embryogenesis would proceed, and I, I can't say a normal <laughs> rate, but. Uh, uh, presumably, you didn't say, but presumably these children, when they're born, are of reasonable size and seem to be okay for a short period of time. I think uh, that you're absolutely right. I guess, so remember when we found the mutation, they were compound head. They have one new mutation, another one that was missing. Yeah. We couldn't find the protein, but I guess that some cells may express some protein because I completely agree with you. If you have nothing of this protein, I guess that that's going to be not compatible with survival. So I think that at some cell level, at some point, they were producing some type of protein, and that allowed them to survive until birth and later. So even we couldn't find the protein in these cell lines, I guess that there must be something that they might be producing. It might be short half-life or something that could be rescuing them from the complete phenotype that probably, as you said, is death. What do you think, John? I think the mouse mouse is, is uh, embryonic mutant. The complete so, mutant, yeah, the complete new. Is there a relationship between glycosylation defects and the bacterial flora of the intestine? We studied that in this patient. We did microbiome analysis, and we didn't find anything different. Keep in mind that bacteria have their own machinery, yeah. and they do not glycosylate, So, but we didn't find any difference between their microbiota and the ones that normal individuals have. So keep in mind that these patients, because they are not getting IBIG and they are not getting antibiotics because they have very few infections, so it was not influenced by any external factor. So the microbiome in these patients was not different than the microbiome in, in normal individuals. And, and bacteria work by themselves, and they do not normally glycosylate. So in terms of the sequence of the pathology, you mentioned they have microencephaly. They also have optic nerve atrophy. Uh -huh. So yeah. which one occurs first? Uh, when do they become blind? When I saw them, were, both of them were blind. So I, and they were not completely blind. They were partially blind. And I don't know what happens first. I, I have no so idea. So any in terms of abnormality of the brain, microencephaly, everything is shrinking or? Some part is more affected so they other. were not that microcephalic. They were minimal. And, and the brain, so if you do CT scans and MRI, there was nothing structurally. So they have no corpus callosum, but the uh, hemispheres were there. So Christina, help me here. So there was something about the neurological thing about the CT scans MRI that... Could you... Repeat what she said.
So to make a long story short, we don't know. So the thing is they had some cerebral atrophy and the small corpus callosum, and so there are four patients total. So I guess that each of them makes it 25%. So, and I have no idea about the sequence, what was first, if the blindness of the, uh, of the cerebral atrophy. I guess that they might happen at the same time, but, but we have no idea. So what we can tell you, this is not a progressive disease. So it means that the way they are born, so things do not progress, do not get worse. So with what they are born is how they survive. Okay, well, I think we were... Complete genome sequencing. Oh, we did that. Yeah. All right, listen, I want to thank you on behalf of all of us. That was really extraordinarily exciting and uh, a whole new dimension to to many of us to think about. So thank, thank you, you very much. much.